Hello, hi um, everybody, and welcome to the um, DC3 conference, and um, specifically for today's session, which is going to be on DLT models for um, wholesale CBDC um, design for payments. Um, as you know, the conference is organized by the Digital Currency Global Initiative, which is a um, joint collaboration of the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, and the Future of Digital Currency Initiative at Stanford University. Um, you may know that uh, there are three working groups um, established in this uh, initiative, which are the Policy and Governance Group, the Architecture Interoper Interoperability and Use Cases Group, which is the, the, the one I, I chair, as well as the um, uh, Security and Assurance Group. I, I do lead the, the Architecture Interoperability and Use Cases Working Group, um, in which we have been studying, well, the architecture and the potential applications, potential use cases of different types of digital um, currencies, including CBDCs, retail and wholesale uses, as well as um, stable coins and cryptocurrencies. Um, in the session today, we're going to be focused on the innovative applications of um, distributed ledger technology for wholesale CBDC design. Um, it's a topic that is quite, quite, um, quite interesting, quite advanced. Um, there are some initiatives uh, very soon to be in, in production, uh, followed by or, or pushed by the banks in order to unlock lots of structural benefits around liquidity optimization you may have heard about. Um, Finality, which is um, uh, quite quite important project that's going to produce what you could call an indirect um, CBDC. Um, quite quite interesting. There's also a lot of research that has been done on um, on, on wholesale CBDCs uh, to be provided by central banks, and I'm sure we'll be uh, hearing about that in the from the panelists uh, today. And also, wholesale CBDCs, I think, is a is a quite advanced topic that is driving as well um, a lot of the thinking in terms of interoperability between different types of distributed ledger technologies. And um, we'll hear uh, about this as well uh, from some of the panelists today. So it's quite a Quite a you know maybe not so well known topic in comparison to stable coins or retail CBDCs and other uses, but actually a very very structural and very important one that is driving a lot of the transformation of the of the uh, financial industry as we as we know it. So uh, let me introduce our panelists um, today for the session. Um, we have with uh, us today Mr. Masaki Besho, uh, um, who is the head of the fintech center of the Bank of Japan. Um, we have Simon Chantry, CIO and co-founder of BITS. We have Daniel Aiden, um, uh, who's an advisor and solution architect at the BIS um, Innovation Hub. Um, and we have uh, Richard Gendel brown from uh, CTO from R3. Uh, hi, all of you. We, we should have as well, we were supposed to have Mr. Kwame Mo Pong um, from the Bank of Ghana, but it looks like there's been a, a problem with the connection. So we'll, we'll, we'll be working on that and see if we can... Uh, um, host him as well and welcome him uh, very soon. Before I invite the panelists uh, for their um, remarks, um, just to, to inform the audience that uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A window um, here in the, in the Zoom link. And, and also you can use the Pigeon Hall uh, facility, which is available um, to send, uh, and you can send your feedback and, and comments uh, through you know, both, both channels during the, the session today. Um, this is the, the link for the Pigeon Hall uh, facility. So if you prefer, you can do it through that. Set, or otherwise, you can just put it on the on the chat uh, here in the Zoom link, uh, which is fine as well. Um, all right. So I'll I'll just 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 keep uh, uh, putting those there, and then we'll, we'll we'll share them with the with the panelists during the Q and A session by the end. We're going to start um, then uh, with our speakers today. And without further ado, uh, so it's my pleasure to give the floor to our first uh, speaker, um, Mr. Daniel Eden, uh, working in the EBIS Innovation Hub for his introductory remarks. Daniel, um, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly, and I'll provide a couple minutes opening remarks. And I'd like to just uh, provide some practical, um, some practical lessons um, from our experiments here at the BIS Innovation Hub on using central bank digital currencies to facilitate cross-border payments. Okay. Um, 
So I'm going to draw from four different projects, um, namely Inthanon Line Rock that was done out of Hong Kong, Project Jura that was done in Switzerland, Project Dunbar that was done in Singapore, and then another project called Project Embridge that was done uh, also in Hong Kong. And the, the most of the content of this slide deck can be found on the paper on the left-hand side called Using CBDCs Across Borders Lessons from Practical Experiments. And I'll provide the link to this paper at the end of, uh, at the end of these opening remarks. So just, just to quickly discuss kind of how these experiments are different or similar, uh, I think it's nice to plot these on the following chart, the x-axis, you can see access to domestic residents versus access to non-residents. And on sorry on the on the y axis and on the x axis you can see the concept of interlinking existing platforms versus creating a common platform infrastructure. You can see the top left corner is very busy. In there we have uh, Fedwire in its version between 1918 and 1970, Target, and then a couple, and then Swift, and then uh, a project called Project Nexus that is a project that comes out of the Singapore. Uh, uh, BIS Innovation Hub Center. Um, on the right-hand top quadrant, we have Fedwire after 1970, and we have Target 2. That means that they are a common platform and there is no accidents, no access for non-residents. On the very bottom, you can see where in the quadrant where we have access for non-residents all on a common platform, we have the Swiss RTGS platform called the SIC, S-I-C, and we also have all of the projects that I'm going to discuss uh, Dunbar, uh, Inthanon Line Rock, Jura, and Embridge that all allow access for residents and non-residents all on a common platform. So since all of these projects live in that bottom right-hand quadrant, enabling access for non-residents on a common platform, let's discuss some of the differences between these uh, central bank digital currency projects for cross-border payments. So Looking at these different projects, the, the attributes that we can contrast are what phase of the project they were at, so what was the output of the project, what types of transactions these projects facilitated, what types of central bank digital currencies were circulating on the platforms, the different currency types, and then lastly, the use cases. So what we can see very quickly from comparing these projects to each other is all of these projects provided uh, either prototypes or proof of concepts with the exception being the Embridge platform, which was actually piloted in a real world environment. The transaction types are either monopoly money demonstrated by the man with the, with the round glasses and the top hat or real value currency, um, which you can see in Jura and in Embridge was provided, th there was real value circulated on the platform. In a few of the projects we had intraday liquidity provided on the platform, and that's symbolized by the sun. And in, a, in some of the other projects, we enabled the central bank digital currency to exist overnight. Uh, it, so, so close of RTGS hours, and you can see that in Dunbar and in Embridge, we provided not just intraday, but also overnight. Um, it, the different currency types, so the currency types are, of course, relative to the different project members. Um, we have Hong Kong, Thai bot in the Internet Online Rock 2, Euro and Swiss Franc in Jura, Australian, uh, four different currency types in Dunbar and four different currency types in Embridge. So Dunbar and Embridge are the larger of the two projects. And then for the use cases, you can see a mix of simple payments, payments versus payments, and also in Jura, uh, delivery versus payment use cases that were supported in the project. Uh, very quickly, kind of comparing some of the attributes of the, of the distributed ledger technologies that we were experimenting with. You can see different interoperability models, different uh, distributed ledger technology implementations, um, different functionalities provided for non-resident financial institutions. And we're focusing on that in particular because that is the trickiest of uh, type of participant that, that you have in these type of platforms. And then lastly, the notion of kind of this platform operator that we're trying to gain a better understanding of. of um, in some cases, it was the central banks, and in other cases, it was uh, private sector uh, participants. I'll close with the insights. So not just kind of comparing the factual realities of these experiments and, and how they differ for each other, in spite of the fact that they are all common platform approaches to cross-border payments using central bank money. 
we like to think of our of our work at the innovation hub focusing at the intersection of desirability feasibility and viability so desirability meaning is there public value in the work that we're doing and that's kind of the the, the circle that's the easiest to start with if if there isn't a desirability then there's no reason to do the work to begin with then we proceed in a counterclockwise way to test feasibility of some of these technology technology platforms and and building them ourselves and with the ecosystem and then last but not least the viability considering the fact that there is desire and there is technical feasibility is there business viability in a, something like this operating in a real world environment so so to summarize what we've learned from these four different experiments and many more that are ongoing uh, currently. On the feasibility side, yes, we've, we've, it, it's becoming clearer and clearer that these type of central bank digital currency tokenized distributed ledger platforms can provide lower cost, faster settlement and operational transparency to all of the participants involved. That doesn't come though without a but. Mm -hmm. Scalability and performance is something that we're continuously uh, evaluating and working on, and so is the industry and the technology providers. Uh, resilience and security is something that's very hard to test in a kind of limited um, pilot type uh, structure, and we'll need additional testing as we move forward towards uh, production-like settings through minimum viable pro products uh, and things like that. And ultimately, data and data governance is also something that from a feasibility standpoint needs to be very, very carefully looked at before we progress forward into production-like environments. Um, on the desirability front, uh, cross-border and international payments are something that's been promoted very heavily by, by, by the G20 agenda. So that's, that, that's a clear mark of the de desirability of these type of platforms in the real world. Um, there is a, a market demand for payment versus payment protection for non-CLS particularly for non-CLS currencies. Uh, and and we're seeing more and more of a desire for cross-border security settlement, meaning delivery versus payment, where the payment is potentially denominated in a currency other than the issuing country. I would say that on the viability front, we're likely um, um, the, the least advanced. Um, Perhaps we have viability. I mean, in, in a theoretical way, we think that there are business models that can support this kind of infrastructure, but we're asking ourselves questions like, if we build it, will they come? What are the governance and controls around these type of systems? And ultimately, what are the regulatory and legal requirements that in a multi-jurisdictional type setting um, um, accumulate very, very quickly and often have um, somewhat conflicting uh, requirements? You can see the link at the very bottom of the slide. Um, uh, feel free, maybe I'll, I'll share it in the chat as we go. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Very, very interesting, uh, very good description of all the things that are going on. Um, so now it's time to give the floor, it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Mr. Masaki Besho from uh, the Bank of Japan. Um, Mr. Masaki, your... Um, the floor is yours. Um, sorry, can you unmute your, <laughs> your mic? Sorry. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, it's a great honor to have this opportunity of discussing DLT and also CBDC or double CBDC with colleagues. And uh, I'm going to use a few slides from my initial remark. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah, yesterday I talked about our uh, retail CBDC works and uh, in tandem with our works on retail CBDC, we continue our explorations on potential of DLT for wholesale or interbank payments. In 2016, we launched a part joint research project with the European Central Bank. The project name is Project Stella. Our motivation was to explore the potentials and challenges of introducing DLT-based platform for the large value interbank payments. We have published four reports on this project, and these reports cover liquidity saving mechanisms, delivery versus payment for securities, and payment versus payment for cross-currency transactions, and privacy enhancing technologies. And in addition to that project, we are working on researches. Last year, in 2022, 
we published a paper analyzing WCBDC explorations of peer central banks and another paper on programmability of payments. Also, the motivations for WCBDC might be different in each jurisdiction. We think two primary use cases would be asset tokenization and cross-border payments. Asset tokenization has the potential to securitize the broader ranges of asset classes and to broaden the issuer and the investor pools. Smart contracts leveraging DLT could make it possible to automate market making and post trades. WCBDC could contribute to asset tokenization as an efficient payment leg for tokenized asset transactions. We are interested in such opportunities and engaging with market participants. In 2020, we organized the Future of the Payments Forum and one of its subcommittees focuses on asset tokenization and its payment solution. As Daniel pointed out, WCBDC could also contribute to enhancing cross-border interbank payments. The G20 has set enhancement of cross-border payments as one of its agenda, and CBDC or WCBDC is being considered as one of the potential options, for example, by enabling exchange of CBDCs issued in multiple jurisdictions. A clean threat nature of CBDC could opportunities to fundamentally redesign arrangements and to incorporate novel technologies. But then, what elements should we consider in designing wholesale CBDC? The point is that technology alone does not solve everything. The first item we need to consider is access policy of the central bank. One of the benefits of a multi-currency CBDC platform would be simplification of process. In particular, use of central bank money as settlement assets in the cross-border environment has the potential to transform the process of cross-border payments, which currently requires a series of replacements of creditors and debtors of the deposit. And in order to fully enjoy the benefits of WCBDC, it would be arguable that ensuring direct and full access by banks not locally domiciled and regulated is desirable. However, broadening access to central bank money might hamper the central bank's ability to maintain financial and monetary stability. Access policy could also be an issue for domestic use cases such as asset tokenization. Non-bank corporate access to WCBTC would introduce further efficiencies in particular for post-trace, but again, alignment with access policy needs careful considerations. The second item is governance. To operate a new arrangement, alignment with regulatory and legal framework is needed. When the arrangement involves multiple jurisdictions, it becomes more challenging. In addition, governance design over the arrangement itself is critical, in particular in case of multiple jurisdictional arrangements. The third item is business model. This is again the point raised by Daniel. To make an arrangement sustainable, viable business model and cost design, and revenue model is critical. The fourth item is how we, the central banks, envision the market landscape of payments and settlements in the future. Actually, we are not aiming to replace everything by CBDC. Our ultimate goal is to bring further safety and efficiency for the payment and settlement systems as a whole. Therefore, WCBDC would coexist with private monies, and we should carefully consider uh, each money's role uh, for the market. 
And the final item is to look at alternative approaches. While WCDC leveraging DLT might bring huge opportunities, it is also important to look at and compare with alternatives, for example, open API access to existing internet payment systems. We need a careful evaluation which approach is the best to fit for the policy goal with less migration cost. I'll stop here. Thank you. Many thanks, Mr. Mr. Brescher. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure we'll be diving on the, some of the topics, including programmability and the interoperability and the ability for different international participants to do cross-currency um, uh, use cases. I think this is going to be part of the you know, very important dialogue going forward. Um, now it's my pleasure to finally welcome uh, on board um, Mr. Kwame Opong. Finally, uh, I <laughs> see that you finally managed to, to connect. Uh, that's great. He is the head of FinTech and Innovation uh, from the Bank of Ghana. So um, Mr. Opong, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Well, thank you very much and a uh, pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I think, you know, it's been a great discussion so far and the issue of DLTs and CBDC has been a very important um, one, particularly as we look at the myriad of central banks that have to explore CBDC for one reason or the other. I think everyone's reason for exploring CBDC varies. And within our context, obviously we have issues such as financial inclusion and payment system efficiency, amongst others accounting for the reason why we're exploring CBDC. However, as we look at DLT and what we think it could do, I think some of this has already been highlighted but some key use cases look quite interesting. You know, the issue of cross-border settlement, this is an area where we've always had to ask ourselves that question. Can we do something at a bilateral level, perhaps with our neighbors, Nigeria, or do we participate as, as part of a broader program with um, some of these ongoing efforts or even make inputs with uh, inputs into ongoing efforts to make sure that there is a multilateral consensus around the standards that need to be in place for cross-border settlement to be possible, you know, uh, enabled by DLT. But of course, then you have to now start looking into the decision-making elements, such as obviously the issue of energy and, and then power and the cost associated in an environment such as ours. Uh, you have to look at the issue of um, technical resources and skills that's available not just at the national level, but at the central bank level as well, because these are capacity issues that you have to be able to uh, look at. But you know, as we keep going through some of these, increasingly, as we interact with other central banks within the sub-region, we realize that there's a bit of a gap and that gap has to be addressed somehow. Um, we also look at use cases such as asset tokenization and security tokenization. And these are things that uh, in our pilots, we actually considered implementing. Unfortunately, we're not able to implement that. It wasn't the primary focus, uh, but we did have some interest among some, you know, a bank who wanted to conduct a pilot alongside as well. We do recognize that these things would have to be accounted for in any CBDC design. And so we try to anticipate that as well. Now, the issues of governance, you know, enhancements, the audits, enhancement, the transparency. I think these are all very attractive to the developing market central bank. Uh, but also we sometimes take a step back and ask ourselves that question, right? What really should be the role or could be the role of DLT in your CBDC architecture and design? Does it necessarily have to be at the issuing level? And I think this is a question that some have asked, you know, within, within this context, you know, considering the fact that I think there's a, you often have to account for the unwritten part and the unspoken part, right? The comfort with knowing that you have a centralized ledger versus a distributed ledger as a comfort matter, irrespective of the technology. And I think if you miss this part, you may miss some potential um, decision-making uh, incentives for the individuals involved in such decision-making points and processes. But it's a question of, do you employ, we have to ask ourselves, do you employ CBD DLT at the issuing level or do you employ it at somewhere else, at least, if you don't have the capacity to sort of execute and implement a full DLT solution. And so we went a different route. And that route was to look at uh, decentralized databases, 
which in effect is intended to give us the same, you know, a certain level of, of high availability and resilience and, and um, have all the key disaster recovery elements that we would want to be able to support a large payment deployment of this nature. Because in any case, I think the world has been able to survive on such architecture over a while, running larger transactions than I think for a market like Ghana would need perhaps in the next five to even 10 years. But on the other hand, is there a possibility of at least looking at DLT? And this is one of the things that we've been exploring, looking at DLT at the second layer, the transaction layer. So yesterday I talked a bit about Ghana's approach, retail CBDC, two tier level, um, token based, where the central bank take responsibility for issuing you know, and, and distribution goes through the commercial banks. And then from there, the commercial banks and other private sector providers provide services to the ecosystem. And that is an environment where we are looking at employing DLT potential. So this is what we're exploring. So that's where now I think private sector players can also be part of uh, you know, an architecture where we're using DLT to support either smart contracts, using it to enable payment, issues of programmability. These are things that I think we think can be enhanced, but also interestingly can also help us with a bit of the record keeping and immutability surrounding that because it's DLT. And when I found markets or central banks with potentially challenges of being able to fully implement and support by themselves, a CBDC fully built on DLT, if they cannot do that, I think this is something that they can also consider, right? As a basic first step to get the familiarization they need with the architecture, to build the capacity that they need, both internally and within the market. And perhaps, uh, depending on what architecture they may choose for their CBDC deployment, can also now consider if there's a potential to relook at moving their CBDC infrastructure onto a DLT. So this is really taking a step back and saying, okay, what is my market reality? What is my capacity reality? What are the benefits I want to derive? And where do I want to derive it? And making a practical decision as to how to explore CBDC. So I wanted to bring that perspective as well to the discussion. And I hope um, that's something we can also get some further interesting discussions around. Thank you very much. Okay, many thanks, uh, Mr. Pong. And um, now it's time to uh, give the floor to Mr. Simon Chantry, CIO and co-founder of BIT. Um, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Fora. And uh, great to hear your perspective, Mr. Opong, from, uh, from Ghana, as, as well as my other colleagues, Daniel and uh, Masaki. Appreciate your perspective. It's always great to see what's going on in the industry. I prepared a short presentation today. Uh, I guess a quick background on myself. I'm the co-founder and CIO at BIT. Uh, BIT currently has a number of live CBDC deployments and as well as stablecoin deployments using our digital currency management system. Um, the eNaira is probably the best known. Dcash, the digital Eastern Caribbean dollar in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union is another. Uh, we've also did our flagship deployment in Barbados with the digital Barbados dollar under the brand M Money. And we're working with the National Bank of Belize on the uh, digital Belize dollar stablecoin, as well as just completed a pilot with uh, Tascom Bank in Ukraine for a digital Caribbean solution. Um, also very excited, we, we recently won the G20 uh, tech sprint with our partners Idemia for an offline solution for the, uh, the BIS and, and um, bank for, uh, sorry, the Bank of Indonesia um, G20 tech sprint competition. So where does BIT fit in this space uh, in terms of DLT, central bank digital currencies, both at the wholesale and the retail level? We serve directly monetary authorities uh, who are seeking to roll out CBDCs, as well as financial institutions who are looking to either integrate with those CBDCs or issue their own stable coins. So we primarily serve the monetary authorities and the financial institutions. And we do that with our uh, our software stack called the Digital Currency Management System. So this is for full uh, lifecycle management of a digital currency. So everything from minting, issuing, distribute, distributing, redeeming, and destroying digital currency units on multiple underlying uh, blockchain-based transaction networks. 
Um, also looking at non-blockchain based transaction networks as well. Um, we, we see sort of a multi-network future and I'll, I'll get into that shortly here. This is just a quick overview so you can understand the perspective through which we're approaching CBDCs. We've built uh, quite a few applications that enable these uh, individual stakeholders to integrate with CBDC networks and in the case of the monetary authority uh, for them to basically upgrade the technology behind their national currency so working on next generation monetary policy economic analysis and controls and so on a quick overview of the solution it looks kind of like this you have the suites at the top which integrate with our architecture which then integrates with an underlying transaction network. And you can see our completed uh, integrations here, Hyperledger Fabric, as well as the Stellar blockchain, and some upcoming uh, integrations with Corda, Quorum, and we're looking closely at OpenCBDCTX uh, through the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Now, as, uh, as uh, my colleague, Mr. Opong pointed out, DLT models are can be quite complex, and there is a lot of, of different options to choose from. Um, what we've tried to do is implement some core powerful functionality in our architecture that we call the NUMA, which enables things like configurable governance structures and different wallet types and tiers and role-based access control and functionality and, of course, privacy and security controls. Uh, moving towards some more advanced functionality with respect to CBDCs and the research that's been uh, put out over the last few years, programmability features, both in the sense of payments, so automated payments or conditional payments, uh, as well as what we consider to be programmable money parameters, which are more things like restricted payments uh, or embedded interest rates or these sorts of things. So we've, we've tried to position the offering to enable multiple underlying DLT models uh, as our, our clients and other vendors sort of um, work to establish the standards for deploying DLT responsibly and optimally in the context of CBDCs. So this includes considerations like who should run nodes in a particular deployment? Uh, and how should those nodes be managed? Um, what level of redundancy is required to truly make a network secure? Uh, and really, who has the capacity and the, uh, and the knowledge to be able to execute uh, these tasks effectively? I think distributed, these networks being designed to be distributed poses quite a few opportunities uh, for, for sort of modern financial rails to be truly robust and to take advantage of, uh, of sort of the, the evolution and the, and, the, and the progress in fintech over the last decade. So moving towards some of the, the benefits, I think the, the crowd here is probably well-versed in, in the benefits that are carried both on the wholesale and retail CBDC side. Um, we've all discussed financial inclusion. Uh, as well as enhanced cross-border trade and interoperability at the payment system. I think what's particularly interesting is the augmented monetary policy tool set. I think in short, central banks are able to now use technology to upgrade their own monetary policy tools. And that's what's super interesting uh, in terms of the evolution of CBDC solutions and certainly the evolution of our own digital currency management system. Um, in addition to that, you could consider targeted accountability, uh, meaning the ability to identify certain sectors based on appropriate metadata and identity solutions integrated with the CBDC. And so this is where we're looking into the future to understand exactly what else could be achieved as these solutions evolve, including our own. Um, now, one of the challenges that we see in with respect to realizing the benefits of CBDCs, largely at the retail level, but also at the wholesale level, is the solution for identifying users. And having a solution, I think the adage that continues to come up is you need to separate PII and transaction history. And of course, that's, that's well known. Uh, however, how do we get the sort of data that makes monetary policy and economic analysis uh, 
more effective and more powerful. And what we're looking at now are comprehensive identity solutions with metadata tagging that still preserves privacy and provably preserves privacy at that. This is all possible. Uh, these are challenges that are being solved with very, very interesting uh, solutions like verifiable credentials, for example, or authentic chain data containers and so on. Uh, so I think these are technical solutions that could unlock sort of the next uh, large sort of uh, body of benefits or, or category of benefits in terms of targeted monetary policy and precise targeted and segregated targeting of monetary policy. Um, also introducing accountability for all stakeholders who interact with the system, uh, not just uh, the, the users at the retail and enterprise level or at the government level, but also within the monetary authority themselves, as well as within the vendors. Uh, any individual who has access to uh, a CBDC system should, should have uh, uh, metadata associated with them that depicts their role and where their user logs could be audited if necessary. And that introduces this level of accountability so that data is being used approvably for the purpose uh, for which it's stated. And so I think this is one of the big challenges uh, to realizing the the benefits of uh, of CBDCs, and it does play quite a key role in the design of the DLT models uh, that that we're looking at. Finally, I'll flip to just uh, I guess a, a thought experiment. When it comes to hybrid CBDCs, we typically think of uh, are they intermediated or are the is the access fully provided by the central bank. And in most cases, we don't see central banks providing uh, access uh, or being the sole institution who's going to provide access. Perhaps in some cases, there will be a department in a central bank who wish to release a, an application to the public for certain uh, purposes, perhaps for financial inclusion or uh, I think their, you know, their reasoning could vary, but in most cases, we'll probably see the the existing intermediaries, the fintechs, the commercial banks, the payment service providers, be the the represent the majority of uh, of market share when it comes to the number of wallets that they offer in market. Uh, and yet we would consider if both are taking place, we would consider that hybrid. And yet there's another type of hybrid on CBDCs, uh, which would be the ability to use the underlying transaction network in both wholesale and retail use cases. So I think this it's an interesting uh, ex experiment to go down because obviously it increases demand. Um, it increases uh, uh, the technical requirements of the solution, both from scalability perspective um, and from the different roles that would be required to access the system. So we like to think about some experiments that are upcoming related to testing out the feasibility, uh, like Daniel mentioned, feasibility, viability uh, of actually making these networks hybrid in the sense of settling obligations in central bank money, because that's really ultimately what CBDCs are. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, I'll pause and pass it back to our moderator. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Quite uh, quite interesting. And then, finally, um, last but not least, um, very happy to give the floor to uh, Mr. Richard Brown, CTO, Far Three, and old timer of the industry and good friend. Uh, floor is yours, Richard. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everybody. Um, good to be here. Um, so I, I'm, I'm Richard Brown. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of R3. We're the firm behind um, the enterprise blockchain Corda that is used for a very large number of, of CBDC projects, both retail and wholesale around the world. Um, what I thought I'd do was add a, a bit more of a technical perspective uh, based on some some very specific real life scenarios we've run into um, to make a couple of points. The first one, um, I hope to motivate some examples of why uh, just like in most projects, but even more so with CBDC, it seems to be impossible to separate policy from implementation. Um, and I find um, when um, speaking uh, to organizations behind CBDC projects, there's often a very strong desire to separate policy from implementation. And I'd like to make the case that actually that's um, certainly not always possible and potentially even dangerous. So I'll give a couple of examples of that. Um, I'll then share a few of the technology learnings we've had about implications for platforms that derive from the unique requirements of CBDC. And then they finish with a potting thought on, um, on, on the role of the end consumer in all of this. 
So if I look at some of the, the wholesale projects and pilots we've been involved in, and the first one I want to look at is the, the implication of, of network design. Uh, so, so Daniel laid out a really nice um, a two by two of, of many of the BIS projects. Um, I wanted to drill into um, two in particular, Dunbar um, and then um, Helvetia and Jura on the other, because they attacked a very similar problem in two very different ways. So if I look at some of the, uh, look at the, the, the Helvetia and Jura projects, these were ones where multiple assets, whether it was two CBDCs or CBDC and security, were deployed to different networks, um, so either cross-border or same country, and, um, and the problem of settling trades between them atomically was explored. Whereas Dunbar um, explored the really interesting idea of having multiple CBDCs deployed to the same network. Um, and what I think arose from that was a really deep understanding of, of, of both a technical and a business um, requirement that may not have been obvious beforehand. So on the on the business side, there's the question of, of consensus and finality. So if you've got a single asset on a single network, it's pretty clear um, that you can reason about who is confirming those transactions. Maybe it's a central bank or, or a party acting on their behalf. But when you have a shared network with multiple assets, a really quite interesting hybrid question of business and technology arises, which is what is the point of finality and who is confirming that transaction? So if I'm a particular central bank, am I the one saying that that transaction happened or have I, delegate, or have I delegated that to some other party? And if so, who is that party and what happens if it goes wrong? Um, and what I think I'm um, looking at some other projects has, 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 um, has, has arisen from that is a renewed understanding that you have to be supremely clear about that. And some of the insights that perhaps some of us have had from public blockchains, where the idea of consensus is far more diffuse and you just trust the network, uh, does that, that those assumptions do not apply in, in the case of CBDC. You really need to know who's doing it. But there's also a technical requirement or a technical complication that arises here, which is you think Think about the practical reality of running these networks, multiple parties all running nodes on a single network. How do you upgrade that? How do you deal with a, you know, a software outage or a, an emergency fix? It's hard, but doable. And, 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 and the well-designed platforms um, cater for that from the start. But you now move to a model where you've got multiple different CBDCs all on the same network, cross-border, different jurisdictions. How do you coordinate upgrades and fixes to that? I mean, it rapidly becomes quite difficult. But I think it was only through the work of a BIS and the institutions who, who participated in that, and of course R3 was part of that, that the, the implication that we probably should have asset-specific, application-specific networks um, arose. Um, so that was possibly the first example I have of, of how policy and technology have interacted. Um, a second one is that whilst this discussion is about wholesale, I find it impossible to separate the wholesale discussion from the retail discussion because the requ it, it, to the extent um, a central bank wants to have a, a wholesale and retail solution, the requirements and in particular the constraints of the retail environment, you cannot stop them propagating back. Um, so for example of this, many of the requirements or many of the projects I see have a desire for programmability in some way, by which um, people often mean the ability to restrict or control how an asset can be used in the retail domain. Perhaps a consumer can only use it for one purpose or in one type of shop or for one type of good. So to two questions arise from that is, how do those requirements and how do those restrictions propagate across networks? If the wholesale network and the retail network are separate, um, how do you propagate those restrictions? There could be different technologies. There's certainly different networks. Um, an implication that arises from that, which may be relevant given the ITU context, is um, if we're going to go down that path, there probably needs to be a standard way of describing these restrictions that is independent of any given platform. Because by definition, two different networks are not the same network and may not be sharing the same technology base. Secondly, the reality in many countries is the dominant retail payment mechanism is the payment card. The payment card network works extremely. Payment card work networks work extremely well, but they have some very unique constraints about um, you know, what information is available at the point of sale, about the goods being bought, you know, what are the transaction sizes, how much information can be shared. Really, quite detailed technical things. But if you want to wholesale. Um, CBDC that interfaces with the retail domain, the policy objectives you can achieve are often constrained by the practical reality all the way out in the in, in the physical points of sale. So that inter, inter, again, that interface between policy and technology is is is, um, is something you just simply cannot get away from. 
And then finally, a, um, I guess a message from my, my, my technologist um, you know, friends on, on this call, um, it goes the other way as well. Sometimes when I'm reviewing code or looking at um, you know, work that's been produced, it's very, very often engineers use terminology that is, 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 is used loosely, but which has very strong legal meaning. So for example, sometimes in, in, a, in a blockchain design, an asset may move into a locked state. It's very natural to say it's in escrow. But of course, legally, it's not. And it causes huge confusion when you're talking to very precise bankers um, and lawyers um, when you use a term that they're not, uh, that, that doesn't mean quite what they mean it um, to mean. Um, similarly, the use of compound keys and assets that are controlled by multiple keys. It's quite a natural way to solve some cryptographic problems, but it does not map at all well to, to, to the world of, um, to the world of, of business and finance. So, so net net, um, I hope I've made the case that the idea of separating policy from technology is, is really quite troublesome and the successful projects are ones that fuse knowledge of both domains. Um, I, I won't labour the point on, on, on privacy as that's already been discussed um, but another requirement that often emerges but people miss is how many of these cross-border um, wholesale projects they're not just about moving value they're about coordinating the process of agreeing to move value. There are complex inter-firm workflows that also need to be modelled. Um, and then in, in, um, in, in closing um, just a I guess a, a plea from the consumer um, I think sometimes we, we forget that cash, certainly in its physical form, it's a product. You know, it's a very, very successful product, perhaps you know, the world's most successful product. Everybody wants it. It's, it's natural. It's very nice to use. It's, you know, it's an astonishingly well-designed product. Um, but just because a central bank has issued one product that is successful, it does not follow that other products they invent uh, will be similarly successful. All the stuff that startups like ours and others have learned about obsessing over the customer, the need for product management, the need to really think about unique value propositions, all those disciplines of product and product management that apply elsewhere also apply. In Recording CBD. stopped. It's a product like any other. Um, and with that, I'll, um, I'll pass back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Quite, quite interesting as always. Um, okay. Um, I think the, one of the, one of the important topics that um, we would like to address in, in, in the panel um, is really the availability of, uh, or the, 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 the adequacy of the DLT technology, distributed ledger technology when it comes to wholesale um, CVDC. Recording in progress. Um, not sure if I concur 100% with you, Richard, about the applicability to retail and also at the very least in, the, in terms of using uh, online kind of uh, systems, right? And online um, uh, uh, distributed technology, I think it's, I mean, there are some restrictions about offline use, right, in, in retail that maybe do not apply so much to, to, to wholesale, but I mean, I don't want to be contentious, but um, I think the point- <laughs> No, uh, be contentious, we should have a debate. <laughs> Uh, after after all the 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 you know the experiments and all the experiences and research and and practical work, um, what is the conclusion? I mean, is DLT a good a good technology that can really you know add value in 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 wholesale uh, settlement platforms, right? For CBDCs. Um, so 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 Daniel, what what do you think based on all the the different um, examples, right, that you've been uh, working on? Um, what, what is your take? Sure, I'm, I'm glad to take a swing at this first. Um, I think I would think about distributed ledger technologies um, as a tool that needs to fit a certain kind of contextual use case. So, I, I, you know, in other words, if you think about distributed ledgers, well, let's look at distributed ecosystems of participants, and then likely you'll find a, a, a good match there. So the use case that comes to mind first, of course, is cross-border cross -border wholesale systems, right? And the reason there's a natural... Uh, mapping between distributed ledger technologies and cross-border use cases is well because cross-border use cases are distributed in nature. Um, usually the participants in these cross-border arrangements want to exercise a certain degree of autonomy and sovereignty over their operational environment, over their governance, uh, and over their ability to, to uh, transmit monetary policy. Uh, and that maps well to these distributed ledger technologies. On the, uh, as I move on from that spectrum, you can look at domestic wholesale environments and potentially argue that the players in these domestic wholesale environments are substantial enough that they also want to incur um, 
a little bit more ownership over the operational complexities and over their own process flows and things like that. And moving along even further, maybe, you know, you can think about more maybe domestic retail environments where maybe on that far, on that far end of the spectrum, there's more, there's less of a mapping between distributed systems and you can reason that potentially a more centralized system um, would work a little bit better in that context. Distributed dis DLTs and blockchains, although you know it's kind of used as this umbrella terminology, I think it's important to, to remind ourselves as technologists, definitely, that these are all shades of gray. You know, on one side, you have a, a, a perfectly um, distributed and decentralized system where every participant is equal. And I think when you think about you know, the crypto uh, markets and crypto economies, even that kind of um, very uh, pure form is still very hard to implement in reality. Most people approach crypto platforms through exchanges and custodians and things like that. So even that kind of altruistic view is, is, is not so reasonable when the rubber hits the road. And then on the other side, you have completely centralized technologies, but DLTs have all kinds of different uh, knobs and buttons that you can twist and turn. And as, as a solution architect, you know, I, I try to familiarize myself with all of those nuances as much as possible, that they can move along on these spectrums um, somewhat, uh, somewhat easily. So it's important not to think about, oh, well, we have distributed and then we have centralized, but there's lots of shades of gray in between. And a lot of these systems can move relatively quickly, relatively frictionlessly between these shades of gray. But to answer yeah. your question as precisely as possible, Leo, I think wholesale uh, cross-border markets are the, the, the best candidate for distributed ledger technologies. I couldn't concur more, <laughs> as you maybe some of you know. Um, programmability was was touted as one of the of those knobs, both knobs that you were referring to, uh, Daniel, and, and some of you have have mentioned this as, as one po possibility. And and we'll talk about uh, we'll, we'll debate about interoperability in a minute. But uh, specifically on programmability, um, I, I know you I noticed you you mentioned this, uh, Mr. Besho. Um, what 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 do you mean or or can you elaborate a little bit further what you meant and, and what, what applications you had in mind? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, there is no commonly agreed definition of programmability. Having said that, in our CBDC explorations, we consider programmability as an ability of a computer program to control behaviors of digitally recorded funds that flow within payment systems. And uh, in this respect, the characteristics that computer programs automatically move funds can already be found in existing payments. At first glance, services such as direct debits and payroll direct credits appear to have such programmability. However, programs for such conventional services are developed by service operators. And today, Programmability is expected to enable not only operators, but also other parties to program payment and settlement functions so as to meet their specific needs. So I think the key is diversity of program developers. And also the word programmability seems to include two different concepts. They are programmable payment and programmable money. Programmable payment is a concept that parties program the procedure of fund transfer, occurring conditional to a certain event or transaction. Use cases such as direct debits or payroll direct credits are in this category. Certainly, DLT is a programmable infrastructure which allows users and developed communities, for example, to deploy smart contracts. However, it should be noted that payment could also become programmable, leveraging on other alternatives, for example, open API. On the other hand, programmable money is a relatively new concept. I understand that refers to embedding specific attribute and or programs in an object or monetary data so as to control its behavior. It might be said in the sense that is painting a color on monetary data and it make even money 
non-fungible. However, this is an emerging technology. Uh, in addition, from central bankers' perspectives, in directions to CBDC, we will need careful considerations on the role of central bank money as an anchor of nominal value to achieve uniformity of the currency. Having said that, if we broaden our scope, including private means of payment, for example, stablecoins, programmable money might be one possible way of development. Just my understanding. Thank you. Okay, that's um, that's interesting. Um, other other ramifications, let's say, on programmability around uh, identity, credential management, metadata. I, again, I think they are probably more. Uh, relevant for retail use cases, although actually um, it is also needed, right? The, in, in, in the case of uh, in Holson, um, um CBC. So Simon, what do you what do you think about that? You also mentioned this this idea and, and, and also the, the you know the interaction with all these different systems around the, the CBDCs. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's interesting, Mr. Besso, using the term coloring. This is certainly something that we see in demand at the retail level, at least for the first leg of a transaction. This is where you get into different stimulus programs or support programs or relief programs uh, where uh, different uh, government departments perhaps are looking to subsidize or, or fund a, a specific uh, either industry or type of payment for a specific group of individuals. And this is where the, the appropriate uh, and comprehensive uh, identification of different user types, even something as simple as metadata tagging for geographic region, where if a, a disaster strikes a, a particular region and a government department wants to provide relief funding, for specific purposes, say for fuel or food or something, uh, that you could do so with confidence that that's what the money is going to be spent on for the first leg of the transaction. And then after that first transaction, after that money hits the merchant with the appropriate merchant category code or the CBDC equivalent, uh, then it turns to general purpose. So this is where these, these sort of metadata and credentialing uh, systems are becoming more important and uh, delivering on some of these more advanced CBDC programmability features. Again, I divide programmability between programmable payments, which are things like just automated payments or conditional payments. If something happens, make a payment. Uh, and, and these have been executed really well at the layer one level in crypto ecosystems already. Uh, it's, it's 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 interesting to see that take place, you know, on on many layer ones with smart contract languages at layer ones, and then also it happens in some layer twos. Uh, in the context of CBDCs, where we as a, as as bit as a company is, tries to strike a balance is what functionality should live at the layer one level and what functionality belongs in our own architecture. And of course, there's different uh, considerations for how how we would arrive, uh, you know, at, at the optimal solution there. Uh, and then on the other hand, it's programmable money, which is more of some of those embedded, I, uh, embedded functions. So restricted spend is 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 obviously the uh, the the more obvious one. We consider that to be uh, programmable money category versus programmable payments. And yeah, I, I do think it comes down to the to credentialing, a comprehensive credentialing and metadata tagging solutions. So this is this is a large part of our focus for 2023. Okay, that's that. That makes all the sense. Um, in, in terms of tangible benefits, of tangible potential uh, applications of the technology to to practical uh, cases, like for example, payments that we've been hearing about, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as as one of the the, the main potential benefits, right? That that all this technology and all this movement could, could bring. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm wondering how to translate that into into that. Um, I, I would I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pong from from Bank of Ghana to see what what what, what you are seeing right in terms of um, the application of this um, to to you know the wholesale CBDC area with the idea of uh, improving uh, the you know the, the existing payment ecosystems and 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 you know, working on financial inclusion fronts as well. Um, Wonder what you what your opinion is on this.
Uh, Mr. Pong, I think you are on mute, sorry. <laughs> So that the most popular word during the COVID. Um, the the key the key thing is that I think when it comes to programmability, I think we all look at the payment aspect, right? Because the potential um, iterations of use cases over there is enormous, and it's also very important, especially in environments where social benefit transfer payments and the rest are very important to supporting the livelihoods of people who fall in a certain um category of the economic on the economic ladder the second thing as well maybe at the central bank operations level is the enormous efficiencies it could potentially introduce into the payment infrastructure right so if you have an environment where perhaps you don't have a faster payment system here you have an opportunity to not just improve your wholesale transactions but potentially also add a bit more efficiency of the overall process and transparency, et cetera. But there's one interesting use case that I again mentioned yesterday, which I think is important. So today, if you look at most mobile money interoperability use cases, the mobile money operators are obviously not direct participants onto the interbank system because, and the schemes, because per most laws, they are not banks and therefore they have to come with a settlement bank. What that also means is for them to be facilitating transactions across different service providers, they have to pre-fund accounts to be able to support um, ensuring that the consumer expects to receive their value instantly, right? So you have to create the appearance of instant settlement, but the reality is the settlement is delayed. And what that eventually does is it compels you to pre-fund an account, which comes at a cost. Now, that cost will ultimately come back to the operations and, and, and filters through to the consumer having to pay for it. So if you take that simple use case alone and take the average successful mobile money market, the amount of cost alone from a financing perspective, that could be eliminated by the central bank introducing DLT to a wholesale CBDC infrastructure is quite significant and I think has a direct impact. I think it will be visible on the PNL of the average operator and means a lot in terms of adding value to that ecosystem. To the issue of on a retail side as well, I think the ability to ensure that you can continue, especially having the right governance in place and the right architecture in place, you can continue to see further evolution of innovation to address specific segments in, a, in, a, in a, an environment that hitherto might not be as um, attractive to perhaps larger players. So in effect, what you would be doing is having a standard in place that simplifies access to the payment infrastructure by innovators in a safe and transparent manner. You're actually able to drive innovation a bit quicker in your environment. So if I'm a small player focused in a certain segment or a certain part of the country that is underserved, it is much easier for me to be able to innovate, develop products and go live, of course, with the regulatory approvals um, than it would be if I have to go through the existing architecture in place right now where uh, it's more bilateral, I have to get in touch with service providers A, B, and C, or perhaps work through a third party who I think that general consensus is for every layer you're going through, there's a cost implications there. So ultimately I might as well uh, come and play in the larger you know, the larger environments and the more urbanized environments because my cost is so high, I cannot even be really addressing the needs of that community that I'm potentially focusing on. So these are very small use case issues. And even from a government standpoint, I think often the use case of social benefit transfers is very, is mentioned and it's looked at as a very straightforward issue, but there are several nuances in there, several contexts in terms of the type of payments you need to make the type of payment to which segments you have farmers, you have your smallholder farmers, you have um, there's the rural poor, you have different use cases for whom you want to support or even relief for post disaster incidents. And what type of conditions are to be introduced into those payments? That is something that also makes a big uh, difference in terms of introducing and exploring CBDC, uh, okay. DLT. But I wanted to make this one point as a question on the page, I wanted to just make a quick um, comment on, which has to do with the issue of whether sub-Saharan central banks 
should be exploring a common CBDC infrastructure. I think it's really coming, and I think it's coming off the discussion we're having about the potential of DLT vis-a-vis -vis the potential lack of capacity to support it as well. I think still we have to be clear on the fact that it has to be situated within your local ecosystem and your local market. And you may not be able to utilize DLT at the beginning, but you have to be able to independently as a country explore that. However, when it comes to the issue of um, regional efforts, whether it's cross-border, whether it's regional currencies, there we have a significant opportunity to explore using DLT to support the type of efforts. It's more multilateral, it's more, it's, 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 it's easier to have agreements around because this is a matter of at, lo at a loose level interoperability. And if you know the first the, the answer to interoperability is not the first step is not technology, it's about the governance and all these other issues that potentially impact its success. But once you can have something that still gives each central bank within the sub-Saharan Africa uh, region the independence to run their own CBDC, I think collaborating on a DLT to support either cross-border payment or a single currency, whatever it is, becomes a lot easier to explore and implement. So that's what I would think would be a viable path forward for the question on the page as well. Thank you. Okay, I, I think this is this is great. Uh, we often, I mean, overlook the, the 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 power of the technology and the well, the, the the approach in general for domestic payments. As you know, in many other geographies, domestic payments actually work well, and it's not a a, a good enough excuse, let's say, to to push something like a like a CBDC. But the topic of interoperability and cross currency use cases, uh, that, that's really what what is bringing a lot of the interest. And also looking at the questions in 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 pigeon in pigeon hole, there's there's a lot about um, interoperability, right? And uh, that, that's something I would not like to 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 let go. Um, uh, Richard, I, I know there's been a, a lot of uh, work done on interoperability. We've seen recent announcements about interoperability, interoperability, but even between different types of uh, technologies, like, like in, in in several um, cases. Um, one of the main questions seems to be arising here: Are we better off with one technology or one platform that brings everything together, or is that just not realistic given the, the structure of the industry and the diversity that we need to have, right, in order to have different you know, type of choices, etc., in terms of um, you know platforms, technologies, etc.? What was your take on that, based on your uh, vast experience on the topic? Uh, I mean, it would be nice, especially if it was, ev especially if everybody was was running on quarter. But uh, but it's but it's but it's not realistic. And um, and 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 this was something we something something we we grappled with because I think one of the the things I got wrong in the initial design of quarter was I thought enterprise DLT and, and the usage of these technologies for things like CBDC. I thought they'd follow a similar path to to public blockchains, where there's one Ethereum mainnet, there's one Bitcoin mainnet. Yep. Yeah, there are forks and there are sort of there are altcoins and things, but, but but there's primarily one network with lots of different applications. Um, and so the the first generation of Corda was designed to support multiple different applications and multiple different use cases. So the Dunbar approach, for example, multiple different CBDCs on the same network was something we explicitly designed for. What we discovered, however, was for all the reasons that have been described. Um, that doesn't appeal. It doesn't work in the in the in the commercial or the or the, or the government sector. If each organisation wants to have full control. Each, you know, each each jurisdiction needs to have full control over how a transaction is confirmed. What are the rules? Who's allowed to be on the network? When are we going to upgrade? You know, which version of the software? And so, so a model where by you know, whereby each, each each jurisdiction or each I guess like you know, each 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 zone of currency or whatever it might be can proceed at its own pace, and these networks then interoperate with each other using well-defined protocols that, 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 that that's clearly the path forward so um so you know we've embraced that fully um in the way that corda works here yeah, we're focusing very hard on how to interoperate between corda networks between corda and other networks both blockchain and otherwise um, and i think it's an inevitability and, and of course we need to remember that not all of these networks will be blockchains so we still have to so we can distinguish between integration and interoperability but these things have to um, have to interoperate 
So I think that, um, that, that, that I think that is that is settled. And so to the question about you know, should there be a single network for the whole of you know, some portion of Africa or so, so some currency zone, it might be a nice aspiration, but the practical organizational reality of coordinating all those parties makes it very difficult. Um, if I may, just to play back very th very quickly on one of the questions about programmability. Um, whenever I hear programmability, I often hear people equate that with the idea of restricting how the money can be used. And if I go back to my 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 comment about thinking about it like a product you know that's not something a consumer would ever ask for i can see why the funder might ask for that or why it might be a policy objective but from a consumer perspective we have to bear in mind that if we're not careful that could be a really quite horrific experience you've got money that you don't know if it will work you don't know which shops how you and then from a technology perspective how you integrate that how does the point of sale know which category code to use the practical reality of that could make for a very undesirable product and drastically inhibit adoption so just because a policymaker can envision it doesn't mean a, a, a doesn't mean a consumer will embrace or adopt it. Um, so we have to be very mindful about that and make sure we're building something that people will embrace and will use. Um, and so when I talk about programmability, I always urge everybody to think about the cryptographic primitives that these technologies enable. If I can get a signed message back that something happened, I could forward that to my friend to say, hey, here's the proof I've paid you. Now, their WhatsApp could update automatically and they wouldn't need to go check. There's a whole bunch of new interesting applications that the private sector could deliver with some very simple cryptographic primitives, which is also an interpretation of programmability. But this idea of money that might not work when you want to use it, that is not a great consumer experience if we don't think it through properly. Wonderful. Many thanks, Richard. Very, very much in, in line, let's say, with, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite good remarks. So uh, I don't think we have time for anything else. I'm just going to ask each of the um, each of the speakers to give us a 30 seconds wrap up or, or final remark, starting with uh, Daniel from, from the BIS. Daniel. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, maybe I'll use my 30 seconds to just build quickly on something that Richard said. I think the focus of interoperability is, is increasingly important to see these, these things um, in, uh, being adopted in the real world. I think the comments around settlement were, were well made and I just wanna tie those two topics together. So the most important thing to be interoperable is the settlement layer of any platform. I would, dis I would make sure that this is distinct from the custody of the asset or the issuance of the asset itself. And I think very careful attention needs to be paid to where the settlement layer is, whether it's onshore for the participants, whether it's offshore for the participants, or whether it's kind of distributed equally uh, between the participants. So uh, um, I think here at the at the BIS Innovation Hub, we're looking at that um, settlement, common settlement interoperable layer very, very carefully. Maybe it has to do something with our name. Uh, having settlement in the name is something that we'd like to uh, increase our focus and, and aptitude on. Um, and uh, thanks for having me. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Mr. Besho, your turn. Yeah, also the title of this panel implies some technical discussions. I will have more focuses on governance and business, and I think it's a good thing. And in addition, uh, many colleagues uh, raised uh, about the interoperability, and uh, certainly this is one of the most important factors in developing CBDC, both for wholesale CBDC and retail CBDC, and uh, further discussions on possible standardization in this area will be called for. Uh, in addition, uh, we had a number of discussions on programmability, and I think the views of other colleagues are basically uh, in line with mine, and I feel quite happy with that. And on the use of programmable money uh, at CBDC, the point, I think, is whether that should be called as CBDC or that should be called as some kind of voucher. I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Mr. Pong, your turn. Thank you very much. That's an interesting one. Um, the, no, I think clearly DLT is going to play a role in the future of CBDC uh, at the wholesale or retail level. It seems like a consensus is building around that over the long term, perhaps not immediately. But I'll take a bit of a pivot and encourage central banks, uh, particularly those in more emerging markets, to consider the fact that technology decisions are business decisions, and in this case, it's policy decisions. And so you have to be very clear about what you're doing and how you employ DLT. But on the other hand, in your CBDC effort, but on the other hand, I think we also have an obligation to start building our capacity in this area. 
it is going to be a part of our social and economic future. And it's important that central banks have that capacity to be able to make the right decisions around how to employ it, whether it's for CBDC or for anything else. But as it relates to CBDC, I'll continue to encourage everyone uh, for, and organizations like the ITU to continue to bring stakeholders together to help everyone come around some of these standards and frameworks and make sure that we have a good quality and standards that are enduring over the long term. And we don't have any issues for exploring things like CBDC at a global level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, indeed, the, the idea of getting a standards in interoperability seems to be one of the very hot topics that but we will, don't have a lot of time to elaborate on that, but very, very important topic. Simon, your go. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate uh, all my panelists' time today, and thanks for the ITU for, for uh, hosting us. Um, I'll agree with uh, Mr. Apong, and, and generally, the, I saw the question on, on standards. I think we do have to uh, pay some credit to the ITU, who was early in, in establishing a set of CBDC standards a number of years ago. Uh, that being said, there's definitely more detail that's required uh, at the platform level for security, uh, accessibility, accountability, privacy, and so on. Uh, we're looking to standards uh, required by critical uh, critical infrastructure providers. So uh, these are th there's a number of different uh, critical infrastructure providers uh, across industries uh, that have to abide by certain standards. Obviously, SOC two is is uh, is a good reference point as well. But when it comes to CBDCs, we're definitely looking for uh, for more detail. Uh, and on on the technical front, you know, we uh, we're contributing to these efforts by way of designing and and evolving our own digital currency management system uh, in collaboration with our clients. Uh, but I, it would definitely be you know wonderful to see more international institutions uh, sink into uh, to that effort, and uh, we look forward to contributing to that uh, this year. So thank you again for having me. It's been a pleasure. And we turn to wrap up. Thanks. So just to reiterate, um, the, the interplay of technology and policy is, um, is, is just overwhelming in this space. So if you don't have technologists and policymakers in the same room when these decisions are being made, you're probably missing something. And then I guess a note of congratulations and an excitement for all the central bankers watching this and involved in this. You know, we're all product managers now. Uh, the consumer is king and focus on them and, and, and the project will be a success. Wonderful. I cannot but uh, echo all, all these this final remarks. Uh, it's been a great, uh, very interesting panel. Hope you enjoyed it. And that's it uh, for today. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.